In 1772, Barton Stone was born in Maryland and was a member of the Church of England. Stone grew up in a time of religious upheaval and was influenced by the Second Great Awakening. Presbyterian minister and revivalist James McGree spoke at a meeting Stone attended, which influenced Stone himself to become a Presbyterian minister a few years later. Stone gained a level of influence within the Kentucky Presbytery, and as he continued to form his beliefs, he came to a firm conclusion that the churches and denominations of his time had long before deviated from the practice of Christianity in the way that Christ and his first church had practiced it. Stone held at his church the largest and most famous camp meeting of the Second Great Awakening, the Cane Ridge Revival of 1801. It is estimated that up to 10% of the entire population of Kentucky attended the meeting at some time during the week. This interdenominational camp meeting was influential in Stone and his followers leaving the Kentucky Presbytery and forming the Springfield Presbytery. Less than a year later, the Presbytery dissolved itself to free its ministers from Presbyterianism altogether and to instead teach a restored form of theology that they believed represented the teachings of the original churches. The ministers of the Presbytery drafted a document called The Last Will and Testament of the Springfield Presbytery, which said in part, We will that this body die, be dissolved, and sink into union with the body of Christ at large, for there is but one body and one spirit, even as we are called in one hope of our calling. As Stone's movement began to grow in Kentucky, a Presbyterian minister named Thomas Campbell emigrated from Ireland to America, where he was assigned a Presbyterian Pennsylvania. Campbell arrived to find politics and division in the churches, and when he offered communion to those who weren't part of the branch of Presbyterianism to which he had been assigned, the Presbytery censored him. Disgusted with divisions among churches over denominationalism, Campbell started a non-denominational and non-church gathering called the Christian Association of Washington in the town of Washington, Pennsylvania. As an apologetic for why he started the association, he wrote the Declaration and Address, which, though relatively obscure at the time, is now recognized as one of the earliest statements of faith of the Restoration Movement. The association was short-lived. Campbell hadn't wanted to start another denomination but to free himself from them, and the association was beginning to look like a denomination. Campbell's followers, which now included his son Alexander, who too had emigrated from Ireland, reorganized the association into an independent, congregationally governed church, Brush Run Church. At the first meeting of the church, three unbaptized people requested baptism by immersion, and Thomas Campbell baptized them. As immersion baptism was uncommon among Presbyterians, this created an interest in the mind of young Alexander Campbell, and a year later in 1812, when his first child was born, Alexander conducted a thorough study of the scripture on the mode and subjects of baptism. His conclusion was that infant baptism and baptism by sprinkling were both unbiblical, and he determined to not have his child baptized. Thomas Campbell, too, accepted this conclusion, and the resulting conclusion that came from it, which was that since they all had been sprinkled as infants, and sprinkling of infants is no baptism at all, then they all must be baptized properly. The group sought out a Baptist preacher, who baptized the Campbells and some others in the church, and soon after, the church was accepted into a Baptist association and operated as a Baptist church for nine years. However, the theology of the church didn't follow traditional Baptist beliefs, and Alexander Campbell's writings began to stir up controversy, including on areas he determined were essential to a church being legitimate, such as baptism being a part of salvation and a plurality of elders in each congregation. Campbell was adamant that Christianity could be unified by determining a set of core necessary beliefs that all Christians could agree to. This echoed a teaching of John Locke, who Campbell was familiar with, and was part of the same idea that would later be expressed by C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, and that would lead to the fundamentals of the later fundamentalist movement. What Campbell didn't anticipate was that not only would many denominations not be willing to discard their specific beliefs and examine the scripture to come to a unified conclusion, but that even those who were willing to examine the scripture often came to a different conclusion than he did. Campbell's movement split from the Baptists, but they did begin to find allies in other areas. While Campbell's movement had been growing, Stone's churches had become part of a group called the Christian Connection. This group, too, made of several smaller movements, taught a restoration of early Christianity. But as Stone and his movement saw the emergence and rise of Campbell's movement, they found it matched even closer to them than the connection did. 
On December 31, 1831, Stone's Christian movement left the Christian connection and joined with Campbell's movement. Decades passed with these groups together, but controversy began in the 1860s as some churches raised enough money to put organs in their church buildings. Having an organ not only harkened back to the wealthy denominational churches, but many in the movement believed that the New Testament was not permissive of instrumental music in worship. At first, the split was informal, but it gradually began to grow. By the first decade of the 1900s, there were two distinct movements, Churches of Christ and Christian Churches, or Disciples of Christ. Instrumental music in worship was just one of the visible differences that stemmed from an underlying distinction in the philosophy of the two groups. The disciples believed that what the New Testament didn't speak of, but didn't forbid, was permissible. And the Churches of Christ believed that what the New Testament didn't speak of was impermissible. Only things expressly allowed by Scripture should be done within the church. 1906 was the first year that the two groups were considered to be entirely separate. Even then, there was not unity within these separate movements. In the disciples' branch, some churches were cooperative, willing to work together and identify together. In 1960, this came to a head when the Disciples of Christ restructured their entire organization into what is now a mainline denomination, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. 3,000 churches in the Disciples branch that wanted to remain entirely independent due to reasons such as theological liberalism and rejection of being connected together with the denominational structure formally exited. This has led to no end of confusion because though these churches have long been separated from the Church of Christ, their churches are often named Church of Christ or Christian churches. There is no formal name to these churches and they are often simply identified as Christian churches and Churches of Christ. As they are on the disciples side of the original split, they accept instrumental music and worship. A lesser known split from outside of the Churches of Christ, though it is well known from the inside, is the division of the non-institutional churches from the institutional ones. This division occurred over the course of decades, but by the 1970s, these churches were essentially a separate group, not working with or fellowshipping with each other. Both groups reject instrumental music, but the non-institutional churches also reject building of fellowship halls or other non-worship related buildings. They reject missionary societies or sending of support to a central church that sends support onto missionaries and they reject any non-church religious organizations. There are about 2,700 such churches in the United States. Another split took place in the 1990s with the emergence of the International Church of Christ. This group began with churches founded out of the Boston Church of Christ, which practiced a high-pressure discipleship philosophy and was notable for rebaptizing even other Church of Christ members who joined. International Churches of Christ were recognized as separate from Churches of Christ in and around 1992. Like the Disciples of Christ, they taught that things the New Testament didn't forbid are permissible, and they use instrumental music. There are around 600 international churches of Christ today. What are the chances of these groups getting back together? Because the nature of these splits has often been on strong doctrinal disagreements that continue on to the present, so long as those disagreements remain, it seems unlikely that mergers will take place. Many churches in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ lean theologically liberal, and so it doesn't seem impossible that their group may seek to merge with some other groups in the near future. But as for the Churches of Christ, and especially the non-institutional ones yoking up with these that they split from, that's probably just not going to happen.